cut it after. So tonight is, tonight's talk is really important, and we've been wanting to have a talk about this for a really long time. So it's going to be on the Eucharist and on what the Eucharist really is, and what we truly believe, and why we believe what we believe. So it's very easy to, to, to grow up and be surrounded like, yes, the Eucharist is Jesus, but why? And so um, tonight, our guest speaker, as well as my one of my great friends, is going to be joining us and explaining that to us. And I love, I love it because the, the Eucharist is the reason why she's even Catholic. She's going to get into that in a little bit, but she was a Protestant for many years of her life until a few years ago. And the Eucharist is one of the main reasons that she lost her battle with trying to convert. And you're going to hear more about that later. <laughs> um, so this is coming from a perspective uh, that we get confronted with so often. Like, that's correct. <laughs> so, um, without further ado, it's a great friend of mine and our guest speaker for tonight. It's fine. same thing through the Eucharist. All right. Uh, we're here tonight during the season of Lent, which is a journey through the desert, and we sacrifice foods and other pleasures. We're asking Christ to be our spiritual food through that, because Christ is our manna in the desert. And so tonight I'm going to ask you to journey with me through some of this uh, discussion I have with the Eucharist. Um, I'm going to just start with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. We have just recently journeyed through Advent to Christmas, where we have found Emmanuel, God, with us. And so now as we journey through the desert to the Tridium, to Easter, to the great feast, may the faith of the truth of your real presence in the Eucharist grow within us. And may that Eucharist sustain us. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so... What qualifications do I have to be here? Absolutely nothing. Uh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Um, the real presence is incredibly important to me for many reasons. Um, I journeyed a great deal through the broken church, or as we often call it, the Protestant church. But I don't have anything to protest. I have nothing left to protest. I have found the most incredible truth and the most beautiful faith and I am so glad to be here with you today. Um, this Easter will be my sixth anniversary as Catholic. Um, my husband's a cradle Catholic, and when we got married, we were so convinced that we were gonna have this wonderful marriage of two people who were talking about the unity of the church, and that was not the plan God had for us at all. Um, but I am a person who has been rocking the boat my whole life, uh, up until I got here. Um, I still rock the boat a little bit. <laughs> That's one of the reasons Angelica likes me. <laughs> but um, I really rocked the boat a lot as a young person. I didn't know that it was odd that I spoke to God all the time as a child, or that not everyone did that. I didn't know that speaking to God on a daily basis while I was going shopping was weird, or that God, it was weird to other people that God might have something to say about what you would do when you were going shopping. 
but that was my young experience. I spoke to God all the time. And the only period in my life where God has been completely silent to me is while I was fighting joining the Catholic Church. That was a pretty rough time. When I was baptized, I was seven, and I was the youngest person in the Baptist Conference of Canada to ever be baptized. They put me through a rigmarole of all kinds of questioning to find out if I was at the age of reason or not. If you care to guess what the Catholic age of reason is, it has historically always been seven. They did end up baptizing me when I was eight. So they put me through many months of questioning, which I remember some of. And I remember them basically staring slack-jawed at me often as I was talking about things of the faith that they did not believe that I could understand at my age. And beyond any other factor in any part of this journey, from that baptism where God called me to be baptized so young. And when they asked me, why do you want to be baptized? I said, because God told me I need to be baptized. I have to be. I'm not a real Christian unless I'm not. Well, that was a big kettle of fish, you can imagine. And I went through all the parts of the scripture that I had read already it's at that age, saying, look, look, this is it's man being baptized. He comes to, he, he, he's like, where's the nearest pond? Come on. <laughs> and, and this is the story where my story really begins for me in my story of conversion was at that point in my life. And then as I turned around probably the age of 13, I remember reading the Bible and I remember seeing that story that has touched me so deeply of Solomon. God said, I will give you anything. And he's like, you know what I really need? Life is really hard and I need to know how to get through it. I want wisdom. And God said, well, because you ask for wisdom and not any of this other stuff, you'll get everything. And I was like, hey, that sounds good to me. <laughs> so I asked God for wisdom. And I think that was probably the point at which I was doomed to enter the Catholic Church. I did not come willingly here. I did not come willingly here. This is not where I thought I belonged. This is not where I wanted to be, but I'm so glad to be here. I also rocked the boat throughout every other part of it. You know, I got a little older, I was in a Baptist church, and I later joined a Christian Missionary and Alliance church, and I said, if Christ commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel, and we as Protestants founded this huge Christian Missionary Alliance, and a whole Alliance church that is entirely based on that commandment, why do we, why is the other, there's only two other commandments I know of, and one of them is the whole love one another thing, and the other one is the Eucharist, or you know, the communion at the time. And I was like, why is it we only do communion once every four to six weeks? If we have developed our entire church system around this other command, what makes this one more important? And then later on, I was going to another church, and I said, if the scriptures say it's a grave offense to come to communion in a state of sin, why did you give me less than three seconds to confess after you just told me that? Do you seriously want a bolt of lightning to come down on me in here? And the response, and, and what I also said, which uh, I was telling someone else earlier, they laughed, I said, when you went to pastor school, did they tell you three seconds was enough time to confess your sins before receiving communion? And his response was, well, I never thought of that before. And I was like, really? You're a pastor. I was not happy about that. Um, and after I had that conversation with him, he gave like at least 15 more seconds. <laughs> so some of these... Um, parts of my history are all of these times when I was rocking the boat before, and I fully expected in approaching the Catholic Church that I would be rocking the boat a lot more. And every time I rocked the boat, people were like, ooh, we have an answer for that. That was not what I was expecting at all. But finally, and most importantly, my journey, when I was in high school, I was part of a, a Protestant group called Bible Quizzing, and I memorized entire books of the Bible. One of those books is my favorite book, the book of John. And as you might recall, there's this very important passage in the book of John, <laughs> which people were having a lot of trouble talking about. And I was like, why on earth that Jesus said, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life on you, would people be walking away if he was speaking in metaphor? Who would walk away for that? That doesn't make sense. And I was very confused. People didn't walk away when he described other forms of breaking Jewish law. He broke Jewish law as far as they were concerned multiple times. Nobody walked away from him. Why did he have swaths of disciples leave when he said that? You can ask that question tonight. But the only answer to these things is found in the historical record, which I did not have access to, because it's really dangerous to read the Church Fathers if you're a Protestant. 
And the only truth that's been maintained is by Catholic and Orthodox churches, and you know, to some degree, Lutherans and some of the other um, more liturgical Protestant groups. Um, but since the first founding apostles knew it to be true. So that's the call that I had, and I did not like that call. Um, there's a quote by C.S. Lewis, and I deeply, deeply understand it. He says, who can duly adore the love which will open the high gates to a prodigal who is brought in kicking, struggling, resentful, and darting eyes in every direction for a chance of escape? That was definitely how I felt. <laughs> I liken the experience of my conversion to having a hand hanging from a cliff, and one by one, Christ prying my fingers from the rock, and the Holy Spirit saying to me, fall for me, cling to nothing, and fly. And I was afraid, and I was angry, and I was belligerent, and he stopped talking to me for months. One day, my husband and I were trying to go to Mass, and we had looked up on the internet the best place to find Mass times when that church was open. And we got to the door of the church, and it was locked, and I had a fit. I was like, this is it. The doors of the church are locked to me. I don't belong anywhere. I can't do anything. I, I was not in a good space that day. I was so mad that my husband went like this when I did that. <laughs> and I always know I'm really mad when that happens. <laughs> he was like, okay, okay, let's, let's back off of this now. I was mad at God because I knew exactly what he wanted me to do and I did not want to. And I have some very sharp members, memories of my fingers being pried off that ledge. And nearly all of them occurred in conjunction with the Eucharist. Um, Paul and I were attending a, a mass in Saskatoon at a, at a church in the inner city of Saskatoon. And at a completely incorrect time in the service, which was very interruptive, they held their announcements. And they said, I want making sure everybody knows that we have bingo on Friday night. Everyone should remember bingo is one of the Catholic virtues. <laughs> and I looked up towards heaven during the Eucharist, which was right after, completely incorrect. And I was just like, this is what you want me to do? <laughs> this is the church you want me to join? Are you kidding me? This is insane. And I pouted, and I did not go up for the blessing, and I did not participate, and Paul had to edge past me to get out of the pew to go up. And I looked up towards heaven, and I, I spat at God, and I was like, this is the church you want me to join? And I heard the clearest voice in my mind say, this is my body. Am I not good enough for you? Okay. Uh, I have a, my, uh, my sponsor for when I became Catholic calls this a holy two by four moment. <laughs> I got smacked upside the head good. And I was like, oh, I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> um, it was a little, uh, and uh, around that same time, I told this story to a group of, of Catholic, of uh, Christian men, or even one of whom was a seeker, that my friend, that uh, Paul, uh, knew at the time, my husband, and uh, one of them had been seeking for many years of his life, and he said, God talks to you, and he told you exactly what to do, and you have the audacity to do nothing about it? What's wrong with you? <laughs> that was also a very important point in my conversion process. <laughs> Around the same time, I was in Edmonton, I was attending a church that shall remain nameless, and they served communion as Ritz crackers with foil-covered plastic shot glasses of grape juice, and it was the last straw. I was so revolted, I almost threw up. I did not participate, and I have never participated in a, in a Protestant communion since that time. I couldn't do it. I was, I was like, this is how you honor God's commandments? With Ritz crackers? We give Ritz crackers to children. This is not right. And it's just the lightest, softest shadow of the greatness that there is in the Eucharist. And since those times, I have had multiple mystical experiences and Eucharistic adoration. I'm not going to talk about them publicly. I'm not even at liberty to share about all of them publicly. If you want to ask me about them, I'll share what I'm free to share. But that has been my experience with the Eucharist. It's so miraculous. It's so different. It sets us apart in such a sharp contrast. And so it's a foundational part of my faith. And it is me looking up at the host and saying, 
at, at the consecration when the, when the host is held up high, my Lord and my God, that has brought me into the church. So if it's all true, what then? How would your life change if you actually believed it? The miracle of the Eucharist. If you actually believed that the substance of reality changed every time that you um, entered a church for Mass, and not only does it change, but it changes you, how would you change? Would you be too busy to witness the miracle? How many people took time off work to see the total eclipse of the sun, but they won't leave work for Mass? And that's not even a miracle. That's just the progress of natural reality. So many of the saints, they talk about the Eucharist as though it were God and man in true reality, and it is. They talk about Jesus as though he were close to them, like he was their lover, and he is. What if they're all right? What does that change for us? It just, this is such a big topic. I got lost so many times trying to do this talk because it's huge. But it's the biggest mystery of the church, and it's so beautiful. And I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, there's nothing more precious to me in all the world than the Eucharist. Um, I actually got a stale Eucharistic host a little while ago. It was really stale. And the cry just came up in my heart, I'm so blessed today. This one is Christ longer than the others. That's how much I believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And I want to share that belief with you today. I, I went to the Theology of the Body Conference in Calgary recently with some of you wonderful people. And uh, Father Thomas Loya said, our faith is about an invisible, incomprehensible, ineffable, and un infinite God who has become visible and tangible. And that's what we're here today to talk about. Not only because today is the Feast of the Annunciation, when that moment happened, but for the Eucharist, which is for us every single day. It's for us. Eucharist is for humanity. We needed this. We are embodied souls that live in this physical reality. Your soul and your body together create the ultimate reality of you. And the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ is what is in the Eucharist. So my favorite gospel, Gospel of John, is going to help me tell this story today. We're going to start with an aspect of the Eucharist that connects deeply to the Old Testament, which is that the Eucharist is our manna from heaven and our water from the rock. So in John 6, we are in the middle of a very long journey for Jesus, where he goes through a whole bunch of stuff, and it is across multiple days and multiple events of his life. He feeds the 5,000, where he takes five loaves and two fish, and he multiplies them to feed 5,000 people and has leftovers. Um, if you're inter interested in the typology of that, the five loaves represent the five books of the Torah, the original Jewish New Testament, and the two fish represent the psalmists and the prophets. Jesus takes the Old Testament and gives it to all of us to eat. Then he walks on water, and he, he walks across the sea, and he brings people straight to the land. He just jumps over something you would have had to travel and he brings people all the way there, immediately. Bypassing their fear, taking control of the elements, and saying, I am. The incredible words. Often in the New Testament, when you see the words, I am he, he is saying the same words that God says in the Old Testament. When Moses asked him, who are you? I am who I am. Jesus often says, I am, in multiple different cases in the, Old, in the New Testament. And this is one of them. He says that. And then he, be, he uh, is found on the other side of the water. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him has God the Father set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Because the one he just performed feeding thousands of people was clearly not good enough for them. 
Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and him who comes to me I will not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all he has given me, but raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? So one of the important parts of this passage that's not focused on very much is that Jesus is telling us, you made a mistake in your theology about the man in the desert. In fact, you made a mistake in your reading. That was my sign already. It was the prefiguring of what I'm about to do. But let's take a closer look at what Jesus did not say. And they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And he said, no, what would I do that for? You don't need that. No, he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And then Jesus said, everyone who has seen the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. So once I return to heaven, the rest of the human race, everyone who's ever lived before this and after is just out of luck unless I give them a special vision of my face. No, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I will give, the life of the world, is my flesh. So in the Old Testament, when manna fell down from heaven, it was in the form of dew. Which is, of course, why the priest says, as the dew fall, right, when the Holy Spirit comes down. And when the Israelites asked Moses about it, this is what he said to them. It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. So they weren't even reading the original passage. They asked him, the, the Israelites asked him, did you give us this bread? Where did this bread come from? And he said, it's the bread the Lord has given you to eat. So it's clear that Moses didn't even say that he gave them bread. So God fed his people because he didn't want them to starve and to die in the desert. And bread is the staple food of every culture on earth. And it's the thing that supports physical life. So that's why it makes sense for us to be our spiritual food. And the precious blood is also our water from the rock. So during the Exodus, the people murmured against Moses and they said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? So when we're dying of spiritual thirst, Christ gives us himself to drink, just as Moses struck the water and the rock, the, the, struck the rock and the water poured out of it. So St. Ambrose talks about the water from the rock being the prefiguring of the blood of Christ in the Eucharist. He says, did not grace work a result contrary to nature, so that the rock poured forth water, which by nature it did not contain? And we're going to have more from St. Ambrose in a moment. He's got a lot to say on this topic. And we, we think that Jesus began his ministry by turning water into wine for the wedding feast. And St. Cyril of Jerusalem says in, 81, in 8350, Once in Cana of Galilee, he turned the water into wine, akin to blood. Is it so incredible that he should have turned wine into blood? So there's a little note about Lent here. So in Lent, we are now going through the desert to rid ourselves of our unbelief and our grumbling. In that same passage where the Israelites are complaining about being thirsty and saying, did you bring us here to kill us with thirst? Um, it, uh, it says that Moses named the place um, Grumbling. <laughs> He's like, okay, I'm naming this place Grumbling because that's what this was about. <laughs> um, and here's the thing. Only in the desert does it become truly clear how essential water is to life. Who here has recently had their water turned off or had kind of water main break like in the last couple of years and had to live without water for a couple of days? It's kind of a big deal. <laughs> like you don't notice it until you're like, wow, I cannot turn on the tap right now. Nothing is coming out and it's making these horrible coughing, gurgling sounds and I don't like that. Uh, I, every time this happens to me, it's happened to me a number of times in various places we've lived, it just fills me with appreciation for being Canadian and for having instant access to clean water and full water pressure because most of the world does not have this. Well, 
I mean, Lord have mercy on all those who do not have clean water or water at all. Um, we don't notice until we don't have something that we need it. But Christ is our water in the desert. When we don't have what we need, he's there. So what is it we actually believe about the Eucharist? Well, we, we believe that there are two things going on here once the Eucharist has been uh, blessed. We believe that there is the substance of Christ, and there are the accidents of what's left over, which is what we can sense. I'm going to do something that's going to make people uncomfortable. You ready? Really, really uncomfortable. I'm going to prove to you that Catholics do not worship bread because I just brought this into a bar and I'm holding it with hands that I have not washed and I'm going to throw it around and show it to you and do stuff with it. This is bread. I do not worship it. This is just bread. No priest has blessed this. We got it out of a cupboard from a little plastic tin. Okay? <laughs> Someone made this. This is the work of human hands, right? It has uh, this symbol of Christ's church and Peter's church on it. But this is just a piece of bread until something happens. Jesus becomes present, body, blood, soul, and divinity under the appearances of bread and wine at the words of consecration. Or if you're from the Eastern Church, you might believe that it's at, uh, um, at the sign of the cross. So there's two different points at which we're not exactly sure when it happens, but we can agree it's within a certain set of, of, of moments. There's a couple of different ideas, but it's not a deal breaker for the church to have different beliefs on that. Um, only through faith do we understand that this becomes something else. The deepest reality of a consecrated host, not this one. This, the deepest reality of this host is wheat. Okay? <laughs> the deepest reality of this host is wheat. We're going to come back to that. But um, the deepest reality of a consecrated host is Jesus. And so the reality is that Christ himself, through the priest, in persona Christi, in the person of Christ, feeds himself with his own hand. Do you recall those words from the Pangu Lingua and Aquinas? Aquinas also says in that song, let faith stand forth as substitute for any defect of the senses. That's the point. Our senses don't work well enough to find God here, not our natural ones. Sometimes we may be supernaturally enabled to, and sometimes God will give us a supernatural reality. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So some critics are going to say, Christ sacrificed himself once and for all, so we as Catholics should not be re-sacrificing Christ. This is what we call the Eucharist an unbloody sacrifice. So Christ, we, we, we believe that the sacrifice was offered once and for all, the same way that a Protestant may believe that. We just believe that at every Mass, from the rising of the sun to its setting, these are words from Malachi 1, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, um, every day throughout all the world we are participating in that same one pure and living sacrifice that occurred through Christ's intervention in the two in, in the entire tritium which would be including the the night that he was betrayed and the, the sacrifice on the cross so we believe that Christ is alive through the resurrection and has made the priest pure enough through all of our begging, because we beg a lot in Mass for the priest to be fair enough and for our sacrifices to be accepted, hopefully, that that is enough for, for Christ to be present in the Eucharist. And that, through the grace of God, it always is, through the faith of his people. And thank goodness we've given recent news not about the righteousness of the priest. So if you go to a place where there's a priest that you don't like, or you don't think he's holy enough, or you don't think anything like that, it doesn't matter. Because Christ can still work miracles through him. So if you've ever seen the priest, when, after he breaks the bread, he puts like a tiny piece of the bread into the chalice. 
What he says when he does this is, May the mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. By which he's talking about the fact that when you break the body and the bread to part, you're symbolizing death. But by putting them together again, he's saying, The resurrection has happened. Christ is alive. And he is bringing that life into us through eating himself. So this is why we always say it is a memorial of his death and resurrection, not just of his death. So at what point does this happen, like I said, during the institution narrative? Um, Roman Rite Catholics believe it happens at the words, this is my body and this is my blood. Uh, the Eastern Rite Catholics believe it happens when the priest makes the sign of the cross or the elements. We're not exactly certain. Um, in the Roman Rite, when we've had Eucharistic miracles, it has always happened at those words of the narrative, which is one of the reasons we believe that. Um, we can ballpark it, is essentially the answer to that question. Um, and this is a precious thing that I discovered in this, which I had never heard before, but it makes so much sense to me. Um, what St. Ambrose talks about is he says, the blessing of man has the power to change nature. We prove that this, the consecrated Eucharistic host, is not what nature made, but what the blessing consecrated, and the power of blessing is greater than that of nature, because by blessing, nature itself is changed. Now, I, was, I grew up in a word of faith environment, where I was taught that your words have power. Uh, this resonates with me, in part because of that. Because yes, those words of the priest Christ's words have incredible power, and it's very exciting. But the better question than when the consecration happens is at what point do we become consecrated as the body and blood of Christ? Well, it happens at the moment that we take him into ourselves. We accept Christ into our bodies, as opposed to Protestants who believe we have to accept him into our hearts. We still need to do that. You can accept the host into your body without belief and it will do nothing for you. Because it is faith that makes it real. Um, well, it could do worse to you if you don't believe it and you, you are in full knowledge of your disbelief and there's a whole bunch of, you know, fine lines there. But that's where the whole drinking judgment, eating and drinking judgment to yourself comes in. We don't want to do that. We're going to talk a little bit about that later too. So when we are dismissed from the Mass, the ancient words of dismissal are go you are sent. And those who receive Christ are sent out to bring Christ into the world, body, blood, soul, and the divinity of the Holy Spirit which dwells in us. And when you take that, when, you, when you're reaching out for that communion wafer or taking it on your tongue, and you say, or, or you're reaching out for the cup, and you say amen, if, if you don't understand the full significance of the word amen, it's helpful, but amen means yes, let it be so. Does that sound familiar on the Feast of the Annunciation? <clears throat> and so, we take that <laughs> the Eucharist and we put it into our bodies and we say, yes, let it be to me as you have said. Let, the, let Christ grow in me. Just as Mary said, we allow Christ into our bodies so he can come out through us and save the world. It's a pretty cool thing to hear about on the Feast of the Annunciation, eh? So why should we believe this? The symbolism is written throughout the whole Bible and as soon as you see it, it just grows and grows and grows and it's, it's everywhere. Um, the priest asks God to accept these gifts as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the Just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek. There's lots of other things I could say, but that's just a little sampling of you know how often sacrifices and offerings and miraculous children and all of these wonderful things occur that bring us to the Eucharist. But primarily it's just because Jesus said so. So we're going to talk about two passages, one's from the Old Testament, one's from the New Testament, and I'm going to ask the question that I asked very long ago as a Protestant. Why on earth did faithful Jews walk away from Jesus when he said that we should eat his body and drink his blood? Leviticus 17. Bet you didn't think you'd be hearing any Leviticus tonight. <laughs> If any man of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood, and I will cut him off from among his people. Okay. 
For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life. Therefore I have said to the people of Israel, No person among you shall eat blood. Neither shall any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood. Any man also from the people of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among them who takes in hunting any beast or bird that may be eaten shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust. Every faithful Jew, and particularly any Sadducee or Pharisee or anyone from the, from the uh, priesthood who heard this, uh, who heard anything about eating blood would have known this passage very well because it is one of the major curses in Leviticus. I will cut you off from your people if you eat blood. Now we return to John 6. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give him for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. This he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Side note, I have been to the Holy Land. One of the only synagogues from the time of Jesus that survives in the Holy Land is the synagogue in Capernaum. I have stood, give or take, within feet of where Jesus said this. The synagogue is still there. It has been burnt multiple times, but it's still standing. It's one of the only ones left. I wonder why. Jesus said this in a holy place. He wasn't just talking to people out on the street. He stood ex cathedra to say this. Very important. Ex cathedra being um, the particular, if some of you are unfamiliar, when the Pope makes a statement ex cathedra, it has to become doctrinal. The Pope, not everything the Pope says necessarily is, but when he makes a statement ex cathedra, it's doctor, doctrinal. So Jesus makes this statement ex cathedra, right from the middle of the tabernacle, right? Or not the tabernacle, pardon me, the um, synagogue, thank you. So many of his disciples, so going back to the, script, to the te text here, Many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at it, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you that do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who those were that did not believe, and who it was that should betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. This, unfortunately, is one of those places where Calvinism comes from, where we believe that God knows everything about us and we have no choices. That's not true. God just knows all of the possible choices we can make and which ones we're most likely to. So after this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. Jesus said to the twelve, Will you also go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. We're going to take a pause for a minute here. We're going to back away from uh, this is a translated biblical text speak, and we're going to go to translating the actual original words. Let me give you a more understandable modern translation of a few of these verses. John 6.55, Jesus says, My flesh is actually food to be eaten, and my blood is actually drink for drinking. That would be a more modern translation of what he says there. So it's pretty specific. Also, when he uses the word, my, my blood is actually food to be eaten, when, that particular, when he uses that particular word to be eaten, he's using the same word the Jewish person would use for gnawing meat off a bone. That is not just dainty eating. That is not anything. He's saying, unless you eat it, really, really eat it. It's very specific. And in verse 60, when it's, when it's, you know, it's, it's put very politely in the translation here. This is a hard saying. Who can accept it? If you translate that literally, it says, this is harsh and effective and, and offensive. And you expect me to listen to this? 
It's a very different kind of translation than, eh, that doesn't sound very nice. <laughs> like literally, you expect me to listen to this. That's the phrase that a person speaking Greek would use. So you're gonna note that Jesus did not say, if you eat my flesh, you'll have life in you, and the blood is definitely optional, and you can pass right by it in the communion line. So this is my own personal thing. I'm gonna to talk to you about it a lot today. And you don't need to accept this particular revelation, but to me, if you've ever wondered why the church is dying, the life is in the blood. We need to start drinking it again. Look to the blood. It is clear that Jesus never withdraws any of these statements about how vital this is. And I'm using the word vital because it's the word about life. The blood is where the life is. So why don't many Roman Catholics receive blood? Time for a history lesson. The reason is the Middle Ages sucked. <laughs> the Middle Ages in Europe were terrible. There were a lot of communicable diseases. The roads were terrible. The growing procedures had not been passed down from generation to generation properly because there was an awful lot of wars. And if you live somewhere other than, you know, Italy, where there's a lot of grapevines, or the Middle East, where there's a lot of grapevines, they might go years without seeing a grape. And it is very, very vital that we use grapes for communion, and the church has always believed this for communion wine. So it was extremely difficult to get and very expensive. There was a huge wine shortage, so the priests would receive the teeniest, teeniest amount of wine that they could make sure that they tasted on their tongues in, on behalf of the people because there was an emergency wine shortage. We do not have this anymore. But our ancestors in Europe grew up without receiving possibly anything at all because in the Middle Ages, a lot of people didn't even participate in the Mass. Didn't receive the Eucharist, but didn't participate by singing along. They might not know Latin, you know, might have not learned or known Latin. There's a lot of participation in general. They might be there, but they may not even have said great acclamations or, or spoken or participated. And so that, that lack of participation and that stepping back from the mass, combined with a healthy fear of God, where they knew that they might be eating and drinking judgment to themselves if they weren't clean, they didn't often participate. This has led to the church saying, you've got to do it at least once a year. That is a minimum, not a, not a guideline. And so it wasn't until Vatican II that they brought this up and they're like, okay, we need to encourage people to receive the precious blood again. But unfortunately, many years of your ancestors were not receiving. And so that is one of the reasons why you see most people in the communion line go up and only receive the precious body. It's a historical reason. There is no current wine shortage in Canada. We are standing at a brewery. Okay. But if, there, if that's not, a, 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 on a theological level, the reason that it is okay to only receive one or the other is that we believe that both species is fully Christ alive. And this is for mercy, because some of us have trouble with alcohol, and some of us have trouble with wheat, and there's, if there is a reason why you can't receive in the ordinary way, or if you need to receive away from the church, as many sick people have to, which is what this, this PIX is for, some of you might not be familiar, but, but having a, this particular PIX is so that priests can bring the very large communion out with them uh, to say, say mass. However, like the sm there are smaller PIXs like this one where they put consecrated hosts to enable people to receive the Eucharist away. And that is a little more difficult to do with wine, etc. So out of mercy and out of God's goodness and grace to us, we can receive one or the other species, as they call them, of communion, and not sin. However, it is encouraged and expected of us that we ought to receive both the body and the blood when it is available. So just be aware of that next time that you're in church. Next time you're at the incredible miracle of Mass. The next reason we should believe this is that we have believed this from the beginning. And as a Protestant former, I have to address this because I was shocked at the volume of information we have that specifies extremely clearly that Christians have always believed that this is the case. The, the Didache, 
which is called the Teaching of the Twelve, which has been recently recovered in like the, in the middle 1800s. It's the oldest written catechism that we have. And it says, assemble on the Lord's Day, break bread, and offer the Eucharist. So we know already that assembling on Sunday and having the Eucharist on that day is the normal practice of the church. Okay? We know that the early church fathers and the Christian apologists believed in the real presence. So I'm picking this one because it's one of the earliest. St. Ignatius of Antioch, who wrote this letter in AD 110, which is less than 80 years after the death and resurrection of Christ, says this, I have no taste for corruptible food nor the pleasures of this life. I desire the bread of God, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, who was the seed of David. And for drink, I desire his blood, which is love incorruptible. And he also says in another document from the same year to an, another letter, um, he, was, he was a bishop, so he was writing letters as, as, all over the place. So this first one was called From the Letter to the Romans. There are more than one, there's more than one letter to the Romans for many different uh, bishops. Um, but this is the letter to the Smyrnians. Take note of those who hold heterodox opinions on the grace of Jesus Christ who have come to us and see how contrary their opinions are to the mind of God. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, flesh that suffered for our sins and that the Father and his goodness raised up again. They who deny the gift of God are perishing in their disputes. Or is there like 14,000 Protestant denominations? At my last count? In AD 170, Athenagoras, who's one of the earliest Christian apologists, wrote to answer the slanderous ideas that were being hurled against Christians at the time. I mean, there's a lot of slanderous ideas that are being hurled against us now, and there's plenty of apologists to answer them, thank God. But this was already happening in AD 170. They called them atheists because they rejected the gods of the Greek and Roman pantheon. They said that they held orgies because they were known to love one another. And they greeted each other with a holy kiss. And here's the one we're going to talk, to talk to you about today, the biggest charge that was leveled at Christians and why they were taken to the Colosseum and droves to be eaten by animals. Cannibalism. Why? Because it was well known that they met in secret for a secret meal to eat and drink the flesh and blood of a human being. The accusers called these Thaestian feasts because in Greek mythology, there's a guy named Atreus who, killed, who hated his brother and he killed his brother's children. The brother's name was Thaestus and he served his children to him for dinner. And this is what they, the charges they were leveling at Christians. Uh, in the 300s, we have St. Cyril of Jerusalem, and he says, having learned these things and been fully assured that the seeming bread is not bread, though sensible to taste, but the body of Christ, and that the seeming wine is not wine, though the taste will have it so, but the blood of Christ, and that of this David sang of old, saying, and bread strengthens man's heart to make his face shine with oil, Strengthen your heart by partaking of it as spiritual, and make the face of your soul to shine. And in 410, Theodore Mopestia says, Just as I would say to any Protestant today, when Christ gave the bread, he did not say, This is the symbol of my body, but this is my body. In the same way, when he gave the cup of his blood, he did not say, This is the symbol of my blood, but this is my blood. We ought not to see the elements merely as bread and cup, but as the body and blood of the Lord into which they were transformed by the descent of the Holy Spirit. It sounds kind of modern to me. I've seen some other Catholic apologists say that exact same thing, but that was 410, 18. The church fathers clearly believe in the real presence of Christ in this beautiful, mystical way, and they believe in the miracle of the Mass, and we must follow in their example. So what the catechism that we have today says about the Eucharist, it says it is the source and summit of the Christian life, it is the very sacrifice of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus, which he instituted to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages until his return in glory. Thus, he entrusted to his church this memorial of his death and resurrection. It is a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet in which Christ is consumed, the mind is filled with grace, and a pledge of future glory is given to us. This presence is called real by which is not intended to exclude other types of presence as if they could not be real too, but because it is presence in the fullest sense, that is to say it is a substantial presence by which Christ, God, and man makes himself wholly and entirely present. It also says, the Eucharist is thus a sacrifice because it represents, makes present, the sacrifice of the cross, because it is its memorial, and because it applies its fruit, Christ, our Lord and God, 
was once and for all to offer himself to God the Father by his death on the altar of the cross, to accomplish there an everlasting redemption. But because his priesthood was not to end with his death at the Last Supper on the night when he was betrayed, he wanted to leave his beloved spouse, the Church, a visible sacrifice as the nature of man demands, by which the bloody sacrifice which he was to accomplish once and for all on the cross would be represented, its memory perpetuated until the end of the world, and its salutary power be applied to the forgiveness of sins we daily commit. St. Teresa of Calcutta says, when you look at the crucifix, you understand how much Jesus loved you then. When you look at the sacred host, you understand how much Jesus loves you now. When we celebrate the Mass, we follow Christ's own pattern. <clears throat> the one that he created for us when he set out on the road to Emmaus. We are on the road to recognizing Jesus. While they were walking, Jesus explained to them the passages throughout the scriptures that were about himself. Then, while he was with them at table, he took the bread and said the blessing. Then he broke it and handed it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Only in the Eucharist do we really meet Jesus. That's where we get to know him. Now we come to the title of today's talk. The Eucharist is a miracle and the source of miracles. The transformation of the bread and wine at every Mass is a miracle, plain and simple. There have been a significant number of miracles, other than that one, where the Eucharist becomes human flesh or bleeds. This typically happens when a priest or monk who is losing faith witnesses an additional miracle during the Eucharist. The first reported miracle of this type is from the 700s in Italy, where a monk who had doubts about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist found when he said the words of consecration at Mass that the bread and wine changed into flesh and blood. We still have the relics of this miracle. They have not decomposed. They're still alive. And scientists have found that the flesh is human cardiac tissue, tissue from a human heart. The blood type is type AB, which is the most uncommon blood type in the world. It's the same group as the Shroud of Turin and the, uh, um, I can't remember the, the other face cloth, which is the other um, uh, item that we have from the resurrection. And in particular, it has characteristics of a man who was born and lived in the Middle East. In fact, um, in the rest of the world, uh, most, most AB blood type is about like less than 1%, but in Palestine, it's 14 to 15% of the population have this blood type. In 1996, this is the most recent one I know of, in Buenos Aires, a woman found a host that had been crumbled up and put in a candle holder at the back of the church and brought it to the priest who put it into water to dissolve in accordance with canon law. A renowned cardiologist was sent what occurred next, which was that it turned into human tissue. They were not told what it was. They were just sent it. This is what they concluded. This is a fragment of human heart muscle that had been under severe stress as if the owner had been beaten severely around the chest. It has blood type, AB. It also has the exact same DNA as the relics we were just talking about. All the other accepted Eucharistic miracles of the church that have been tested by scientists have found the same. Cardiac tissue from a human heart and AB blood type. The second type of miracle I'm going to talk about is that there are saints that have eaten only the Eucharist for years. Proving Christ's words, my flesh is real food. Uh, the most famous of which is St. Catherine of Siena. For the seven year period prior to her death, she took no food into her body other than the Eucharist. The fasting, she did this to fast on purpose. She wasn't sick. Uh, she maintained a very active life during those seven years. As a matter of fact, most of her great accomplishments occurred during that period. Not only did the fasting not cause her to lose energy, but became a source of extraordinary strength. She was stronger and more vital in the afternoon after having received the Lord in the Eucharist. And the most recent of these miracles I've found is in the 1900s, um, a woman, and this happened all the way up to 1981, when this lady died. Martha Robin in France ate only the Eucharist for 50 years. Hundreds of thousands of people visited her in France. No one ever saw her eating. Their, her cause for canonization is, is under review at this time. Uh, she also had stigmata. And we also know of Padre Pio, who's had, had stigmata as well. So there's, these are not old miracles from hundreds of years ago. Many of them have occurred in the last thousand years, the last hundred years, the last 20. Some of them are probably happening right now that we just don't know about yet. The Eucharist 
has healing power. I could not even sample for you the number of men, women, and children who've received physical, emotional, and spiritual healing through Eucharist. Uh, Father Raniero Cantamissa, the homilist of the people household, says this, Eucharistic contemplation has an extraordinary power of healing. In the desert, God ordered Moses to raise a bronze serpent on a pole. All those who were bitten by poisonous snakes and then looked at the bronze serpent were healed. This is in Numbers, Numbers 21. Jesus applied the mysterious symbol of the bronze serpent to himself. Again, this is John 3. What should we do then when afflicted by the venomous bites of pride, sensuality, and all the other illnesses of the soul is not to get lost in the vain considerations or to seek excuses, but to run before the blessed sacrament, to look at the host and let healing pass through the same organs through which evil so often passes, our eyes. So, the next time that you go to Mass, and the priest lifts it up, lifts up the host that has been consecrated. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. Day after day, week after week, month after month, all over the world. All right, take a breath. All right, the next one is the one that many people may be a little more familiar with, but it's really beautiful. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. The priest is acting in the person of Christ as though Christ himself is blessing his body for us, as he did that day before his death. He speaks the words of John the Baptist at the Eucharist, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because we must see him, as Jesus said. Somebody had to die as the consequence for your sins, and that someone should have been you. Would you step in front of someone that you love? If a gun was pointed at their heads, dive into freezing water, save them from drowning. The Apostle Paul writes, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So why do we call the bread the host? The term comes from the Latin word hostia, a sacrificial lamb. We make these the work of human hands, and then we bring that work to the altar for Christ to transform it so he can transform us. This is a way in which we participate in the Mass. The individuals who are coming up the aisle to make to the, call the presentation of the gifts, they are doing that on behalf of all of us. It's not just those people. We are doing it on behalf, they're doing it on behalf of everyone present, just as the Israelites brought sacrifices to the temple for the priests to sacrifice. So the gifts represent us and the people bring them, uh, emphasize the fact that we are asking for God to do this for us. On the 14th day in the afternoon, on the eve of Passover, the male lamb from the sheep or the goats, the Jews or the Gentiles, without blemish in the prime of life, is brought into the house for four days as Jesus came in to Jerusalem for four days before he was crucified, whose bones could not be broken whose body was not to remain unconsumed overnight as Jesus came down from the cross the same day he died, whose blood brought safety from judgment and delivery, deliverance from slavery. During the period of Exodus in ancient Egypt, the lamb was deified and worshipped as a god. By Egyptian law, it was forbidden to harm a lamb in any way. Such an act was a crime punishable by death. For this reason, Moses refused Pharaoh's offer that the Jews bring their sacrifice to God inside Egypt. Following that third plague is when that happened. Moses explained to Pharaoh that it would be impossible for his people to sacrifice these animals in the land because the Egyptians would execute them. The Almighty therefore tested the faithfulness of the Jewish people. He commanded them to kill Egypt's cherished God and place the Lamb's blood on their doorposts displayed for all of their neighbors to see. And only those Israelites who, like Abraham, demonstrated that they feared nothing but the God of Israel were deemed worthy to have their homes passed over during the tenth and final plague when the firstborn sons of Egypt were killed. The Passover is an incredible Jewish feast that has so many beautiful significances and you can apply every one of them and look at the theology of every one of them to know that it was a feast created for this, created for us, created as the preface to the true covenant that God was about to make with humankind. 
The other significance, and the last that I'm going to major one I'm going to talk about today, is the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm going to get a little sexy in here, people. <laughs> Bet you didn't expect that was going to happen tonight either. <laughs> Just as the groom gives his body to his bride as a wedding gift, Christ gives his body to us in the Eucharist. How many of you would have or are having a big wedding? How much did that reception banquet cost? Did your guests pay for it? <laughs> No? Why? Because Christ doesn't ask us to pay for his banquet either. No marriage supper could be more expensive and still be free. Uh, the other metaphor to look at is as the dew fall, also dew is, is like you know, the nature's you know, form of, of uh, sexual activity with flowers. And then just as the Holy Spirit came to Mary to bring Christ alive into her womb, he comes to the fruits of the earth to bring Christ alive in them. So the altar is also the marriage bed where Christ says, this is my body given for you. The priest symbolically marries the church as a symbol of the great heavenly marriage supper of the Lamb in which we participate in the Mass. So if anyone tells you the priests should be married, you can tell them they already are because they are married to the church even in those in times and places where priests are allowed to be physically married to a spouse, and there are priests who are allowed to do this, just not in the Roman rite, they are still married to the church too. I'm not sure if I would want to share that way, my husband, but that is the way that Christ has ordained all these things to be with the priesthood. So the Eucharist is the consummation of the eternal marriage where we will experience the full ecstasy of God's glory. The fulfillment of everything that we ache for with our whole being that sex gives us the tiniest glimpse of. And although the body, and although the priest says the body of Christ when administering the host, and the blood of Christ when presenting the cup, we are still receiving Christ whole and entire in either case, just as I said before. This unites us to the eternal celebration of the Mass in heaven. When the priest says, Lift up your hearts. And we say, we lift them up to the Lord. This is what St. Cyril says about this. For in this most solemn hour, it is necessary for us to have our hearts raised up with God and not fixed below on the earth and earthly things. Let no one come here then who could say with his mouth, we have lifted them up to the Lord, while he is preoccupied with the things of the earth, with physical cares. In the Eucharist, we are going to heaven for a brief moment, and in that point we sing, holy, 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 with all of the angels of heaven. If you'd like to learn more about that particular aspect, I don't want to talk a lot about that today, but you can read Scott Hahn's The Lamb's Supper or look at uh, a talk that he gave about The Lamb's Supper, which is online. It talks about how the book of Revelation is the celebration of the Mass in heaven and how it is so clear that our celebration of the Mass mirrors what is happening in heaven at this time. Um, just to make, give all of you some healthy Catholic jealousy, I got a hug from Scott, Scott Hahn once. Pretty awesome. It's like, thank you for telling me about Mary. He's pretty great. But remember to only proper practice, pro like proper Catholic jealousy, not the regular kind. <laughs> Finally, the Eucharist is our thanksgiving. It's from the Greek verb, which means the giving of thanks. Eucharisteo. If you believe in the God of the church, you must believe that you deserve nothing and that everything is a gift, not just the Eucharist though it is the greatest gift, but everything you have and everything you are and everything you think and every gift you've been given, it comes from God, the great giver of all things. In Christ, there is no deserving. There can't be. The word deserve does not belong in a Christian mindset. It is utterly incompatible with our faith. You cannot deserve anything in light of what has been done for us. We are all like sheep who have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And if this is all true, we owe so great a debt of ingratitude that we cannot possibly pay. And the only way, the only way, is for Christ himself to enable our gratitude through making his sacrifice ours. This sacrifice of the Mass is to atone for that great ingratitude. And only by giving us something great enough to give to him can we give thanks adequately. 
This is why the priest says, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And we must say it is right and just. And he says it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks. But really, the only place that we can adequately give him thanks is in the Eucharist. So today, I challenge you to unwrap this gift of Christ. When you see the Eucharist held high, this is just bread. When you see the Eucharist, the transformed bread, whose substance is no longer wheat, but Christ. See it held high in the air and you exclaim like a child who's got a gift on Christmas and they don't even know what it is yet because we have no idea. Thank you, thank you, because you know that the giver is good. I'm just gonna read a couple of uh, prefaces for you. Through his cross and resurrection, he freed us from sin and death and called us to the glory that has made us a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart. Everywhere we proclaim your mighty works, for you have called us out of darkness into your own wonderful light. You have no need of our praise, yet our desire to thank you is itself your gift. Our prayer of thanksgiving adds nothing to your greatness, but it makes us grow in your grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this is the invitation. Are you hungry? Does your heart ache for more from this life? Come to him. Eat from the lavish banquet he's prepared for you, his bride, his dearly beloved. Are you thirsty? Do you long for close relationships with people and with Christ? Are you dying from the poison of this world? Look up to the snake in the desert. When Christ was on the cross and he said, I thirst thirsted for us, for our relationship. He is thirsty for us still. Come to him and drink from the cup of salvation and healing. I'm going to pray to end, and the response is, Amen, let it be so. This Lent, may we remember that it's our sin that's killed the lamb, and be filled with repentance, body, mind, and spirit. Amen, let it be so. This Lent, may we fast, starving ourselves of everything that hinders us, so we may eat our fill of the Eucharist, our manna from heaven. Amen. Let it be so. This Lent, may we drink nothing that quenches our thirst like the wine and water of his precious blood, as the Israelites drank water from the rock in the desert. Amen. Let it be so. This Lent, may we give sacrificially to charity as we remember the great sacrifice that was made for us seeing the living icons of our fellow men and doing to the least of these as to Christ himself. Amen. Amen. Let it be so. This Lent, may we speak to you in prayers of adoration as though you were present with us, as you truly are in all the tabernacles of the world. Amen. Amen. Let it be so. This Lent, may you become as real to us in the Eucharist as you have been to your saints. Amen. Amen. Let it be so. This Lent, at the Eucharistic banquet, May all of us remember the source of our happiness as we hear the words of the priest, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Amen. amen. Let it be so. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you guys for listening tonight. I am super excited. If anybody's got questions, I would love to hear them. to put this this talk together. <laughs> Kept me up at night a few times. <laughs> okay, so for those who are not there yet, who still struggle with this is more of a symbol, like what can we do to deepen your faith in the Eucharist as a body of Christ? There's a couple of things. 
Um, one of them is that the key, part of the key to the Eucharist is the thanks part, giving thanks. If you, if you come to Christ in the Eucharist um, in faith, as much as you can, you know, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, or even, Lord, I'm not even sure I believe yet, but help my unbelief anyway, um, make sure that you come thanking him for what he did. Because if, you, if, if you're thanking him for anything, anything that you can believe, Maybe you can thank him for the weather and that's all you've got that day. That's okay, right? I think coming with thanksgiving will open it up for you. I think the other thing that really opens up the Eucharist for many people is um, whether or not you believe in the real presence, as many people don't, uh, who, who claim to be Christians and who, who claim the right of Christianity. Um, if you believe in God, you believe that Christ sacrificed himself, and you can enter into that, into that moment when you're there, that is part of the, the, the process, I think, is recognizing what's truly happening. I think the other thing, too, is um, learn about the parts of the Mass. Like, understand the whole service of the Mass and what's happening. I have a great resource for that if anyone's interested. I actually just found it today. I'm really excited. Um, but there's someone who put together, like, a year's worth of bulletin inserts going through every part of the Mass and talking about what they mean, which is great. Um, that's all available online. So if you don't understand the whole Mass and what's happening, it's also very likely to just be a happening to you. Something is happening here. I don't really know what it is. Um, I think the other answer I would put to that is um, talking about the... the the combination of faith and trust, and how we don't we don't we don't talk about we talk about the word faith. Sometimes we throw the word out there and we don't define it. We don't talk about what faith means, but faith and trust. The word trust in English, I think, is maybe a closer way to the way a lot of saints talk about the Eucharist. So learning to trust God, like learning to trust anyone, involves spending time with them and acknowledging that they haven't wronged you. Right? God never wrongs us. So if we trust that he has our best interest at heart, which we don't, <laughs> like, do we really? No, not most of the time. But if we can learn to try, like, think about the ways in which you have seen Christ, you know, the way, the way that Christ responds to Thomas is this, and, and to others, you know, the way God responds to people when they ask for signs is, okay, <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's a lot to ask God for a sign, but some, many people who are looking for belief in the Eucharist or are experiencing difficulty with that belief have received signs from God, one, or, one way or another. Many people have received signs that they will not accept. Um, in particular, I, I used to know someone, I'm not going to give any details about them, but I used to know someone who, who had told me that they were basically just like, you know, God, if you're real, give me a sign. And then, like, they were standing by a river and, like, something, like, floated right out to them. And there's a stick in the shape of a cross that floated right to them. And they're like, well, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> and they wouldn't, they couldn't accept it. They're still not, they're still not uh, believers this day. So, when God gives you a sign, try and think about it for a while. And I think there's, like you said, most of these like Eucharistic miracles that happened in history, they were when people were doubting, or sometimes people were people were doubting, or sometimes people were asking God for a sign or asking the question, right? Mm -hmm. In their heart, they're asking, like, is this really you, God, right? And yes. so God God isn't afraid of our like, oh my gosh, he's asking a question, like, oh, I'm intimidated by this human and their question. Like, Humans are often afraid of our of other humans' questions, but God is not. <laughs> God is not afraid of our questions. He's even okay with our rocking the boat a little bit. Thank God. He made me that way. It's his fault. So the resource you're talking about is like more Yeah, um, I'll, uh, if anyone's interested in my notes for today or, or that resource or any of that, I can send people links for that afterwards. I'll just uh, make sure I can take a put up with everyone's information. And I am taping today too if you want to talk about anything. Yes? So maybe I misunderstood this The idea of somebody who is fully aware of the Eucharistic presence, mm -hmm. and they are either in a state, they're in a state of wrath with God, or oh, okay. yeah. um, rejecting the faith, but they're fully aware of that Eucharistic presence, yeah. and 
choose to receive the Eucharist anyway, and you said like that's such a really there's a there's all these bad things that can happen with that. I'm really curious to hear more about that. Only God knows if we are fully aware, for one thing. So we can't necessarily even judge that ourselves. However, um, I was I was speaking with my um, I have have a priest as a um, personal advisor, and I was asking him a couple questions today, and one of the things he said is that we have to remember that spiritual participation in the Eucharist is just as valid and not lesser as physical participation in the Eucharist. So there is nothing wrong with saying, I'm not going to participate bodily in the Eucharist today. I'm going to spiritually participate because I am not in a place where I should be. One of the problems is that most people are not catechized enough to understand this. So they don't realize that the equally valid and good thing, which many of the saints have done throughout history and is just as beautiful, is that you participate by your presence with the presence of God in the same way as you would in adoration, right? You accept the real presence as it comes, you understand it, you go up for a blessing, but you do not partake physically of the Eucharist because it is in the physical bringing Christ into your body, wherein the potential for passing judgment on yourself is. So I think that's like Paul says in Corinthians that like, um, I mean, if you eat and drink unworthily, then you eat and drink damnation on yourself. Yes. And he says this is, he then says this is why some of you are sick and some of you have even died. Yes. So part of what is, part of what is happening is that um, we need to schedule in our, into our lives, as a, as a person who's actually been a time management coach, please schedule going to get absolution from a priest. Schedule it in such a way that you do not go for long periods of time without it, and then come to the person and be like, uh-oh, this is not gonna be good. <laughs> um, but be aware and be of great grace to our poor priests who are overrun because we have a massive priest shortage and it's very difficult for them to get all of the faithful into their time, their actual literal physical time to give absolution to us. And um, they are so good at not complaining about it when you tag them at 9.30 p.m. after the last mass. And they're like, please give me absolution. Like, they'll still help you. <laughs> Sometimes they will take a really deep breath and then say yes, but they will, <laughs> but they will help you. So we, we must be responsible for that part of our lives as well in order to avoid that occasion. But it is fine to not receive the Eucharist when you think you may be in a state of sin. And that's ideally what it's for. If we are coming to Mass every week, then Christ is going to poke us every week until we forgive that person or we stop being angry about that. We're gonna, we have to go to absolution. Right? And I'm saying absolution specifically. I know you're, some of you are thinking, does she mean reconciliation? Yes, I do. But the absolution is the particular part in which we're speaking about the Eucharist. Right? Until we receive that grace of absolution, we are not allowed to partake in the Eucharist while we're that angry. So um, for, for those of you who, like me, are people who you know, speak to the Holy Spirit in verbal terms, which I have most of my life, I ask, <laughs> like, am I OK here? and I will often receive some sort of big fuzzy thing or, or a yes or a no, right? But your conscience is very powerful. And I would say, if your consciousness is screaming no, that's a very good sign that you shouldn't do it. But if you're getting big wishy-washy stuff, that's a good sign that you shouldn't do it. But if you're, getting, you know, if you're, if you're sort of examining your heart and you're just like, no, I know, I don't see can't think of anything, but I'll tell you what usually happens to most people. All right, okay, now just close your eyes. Think to yourself, when, the, when you last, have you had a time when you went to the Mass and you were, um, were coming into Mass and you were going through and you're saying, you know, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, and you're like, oh yeah. <laughs> through what I've done and what I failed to do, oh yeah. That was that time, there was that. Some of those sins are not bad. You can open your eyes now. Some of those sins are not bad enough. Pardon me. <laughs> right? Some of them are venial sins. But your whole, the Holy Spirit will bring them to you.
you in those moments that are ordained for that purpose, right? That moment and the moment, you know, just before the mass, before the uh, consecration, pardon me. There are moments for you to have those, those, you know, things come up in your heart. And when they do, study them for a second and be like, did I know what I was doing when I did this? Right? Did I, did I really know? And like, if you could answer yes, then like, yeah, I did. That was bad. <laughs> That's, that's your little like mental note. Put, put it away. Don't keep it with you through mass. It doesn't belong to the rest of it. We're at a celebration. <laughs> put it in a box and be like, all right, the end of mass, I'm gonna make my little note that I'm going to reconciliation, right? And then if you, if you realize that it's bad enough, which you'll know, that's, that's a, that's a um, <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard the conscience called an organ. It is a functional part of humanity, right? It will tell you. That is what it's there for. Um, if it's really fuzzy and you don't know, err on the side of caution and just go to a priest and get, get confession and get absolution, right? And then learn a little bit more about what the saints talk about and, and ask priests about the idea of spiritual communion in the Mass, coming to the Mass in that way. Um, I th so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself, which, you know, don't, don't gasp, but I actually received communion before I became Catholic. Um, I did talk to a priest about it in advance, but he kind of wishy-washed about it. He <laughs> didn't give me a final answer. And I, I was literally felt like I was starving at that time. I would go into the mass and I would physically feel like I was starving every time I went in. But no one ever taught me how to spiritually partake in the mass. I didn't know that. This was the only way I knew how. And so I, I was partaking in the mass before I was uh, confirmed, which is completely improper, don't do that. But um, it was um, because I didn't understand how to spiritually participate in the Mass. Now, there are ways to spiritually participate in the Mass, but it's not that complicated. What it means is, when the priest says, lift your heart up to God, right? It's like, okay, I know this is real. I know this is really happening. I trust, and I'm, I'm here. And sometimes you can't do that because you're too mad. That happens, right? That's okay. Sometimes you're not going to be able to spiritually participate because you're just not in the right place. And God is there for that. And he will allow you to yell at him at a later time when you're not disrupting other parishioners. Um, but that is, uh, that is the, you know, um, the real answer is we must learn to spiritually partake in the Mass so we don't even drink judgment on ourselves. Because we're still participating. And it is not some lesser horrible form. Um, and I think, you know, for... Uh, I've, I've heard questions, you know, people have leveled questions like, well, what do you do if you're allergic to gluten and an alcoholic? And I'm like, well, you pray a lot. Um, but spiritually, you'd have to participate spiritually in the Mass and either ask for the miracle of being able to um, purchase low-gluten hosts if you're okay. Well, if you're allergic to wheat, that would be the particular one because it still has to have wheat in it. Just can, like, whether your sensitivity is wheat or gluten would determine, right? But it is an incredibly rare scenario, and this always comes up when these things come up. People are just like, what is the most rare thing that could ever happen? And answer this question. And I was like, that is what the grace of God is for. The rarest thing that could ever happen is covered. So maybe this is coming from the position of a more pastoral priest, but I've heard it said before. Um, and I mean, from what I'm understanding what you're saying is that it's kind of like um, it's not a mortal sin unless you're aware it's a mortal sin, and so on. So in that respect, yes. if you're not desperate, Yes. So in that respect, um, I've heard it said, um, and again, like I said, maybe more pastoral approach, yep. is that even in the state of fallen grace, you're encouraged to still receive the Eucharist despite that, because of the grace is received necessary to sort of come back hmm. to Jesus in that respect. And I, I would assume... I'd say in that case, the grace that's necessary is reconciliation. Right, yeah. I, and I would agree, but I've been yeah. told that before. Or yeah. That, like well, you never don't take or take in the Eucharist, no matter what. Yeah. Celebration that is that is a common thing to say, it. and that's dangerous, unfortunately. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, you can yeah. actually take it back. I was gonna say, like, it's true that the Eucharist has the the power and the grace to forgive venial sins, right? Mm -hmm. But yes. it is a sacrilege. Uh, now, a venial yeah. sin being a sin that you are not fully understanding of. Well, that being Continue. one of the well, that is the one that's typically at discussion in this yeah. case. But that is the understanding is the thing at question here. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a sense of, uh, so I think when you're saying kind of blocks you and pushes you away, mm -hmm. 
the so the lack of preparation and your awareness of this lack of preparation pulls you away because it's your own humanity coming in between you and the Eucharist. And it's a pride thing too. Yes, um, often. Oftentimes. I so have no experience with that. Right. And it, <laughs> so it I, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether it's well, God is gonna help me, it's still a pride thing. So in itself it's it's not it's hard not to go up and maybe make a bit of a scene by people knowing around you that you know you're somebody who normally receives, why are you not? <laughs> Well, it used to be that we confessed to each other in circles where we just confessed to everyone that we knew. We have moved past that, maybe for better or for worse. But. Uh, <laughs> they used to, you used to confess in front of your You used to confess in front of your entire congregation, including your family. Yes, so you, if, you got, if you're standing, your non married self, and said, I slept with somebody, like you're confessing in front of your mom. And yeah. Like yeah. Cousins and their shit. Yeah, so that is a kind of commun that is a kind of communion of the saints that I think we could probably so, so have. I've had like a priest say to me about that is that it is it is like a good kind of courage, uh, like to and it's a good witness to others. So there's probably other people who are feeling like they're afraid to not receive. So like oh somebody will like wonder why I'm not receiving, um, but that is, it's a good example for people, right? Because if, it's, if, if the reason you're receiving, the reason you're choosing to receive instead of not receive is because other people will see it, like you can tell that that's a very human kind of yeah. reason that's not coming from God, right? Yeah. Um, that sounds like a Satan reason. <laughs> <laughs> what will people think? What will people do? My mom used to do that. Whenever I went to receive, yeah, and well, I think I think that it can be good or bad, right? I think if we were in proper relationship with each other, it wouldn't be as scary as it sounds, right? If if we were in true relationship with each other, to love each other completely as we ought to be loved, the confession to each other would not be the same, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't have that same, not quite the level of fear. I don't think it would be fear without fear entirely, certainly not, but it wouldn't be that, it would be different if that was your common practice to confess with each other and to, to speak about sins with each other. And I think we don't do enough of that as the church. I, I don't think, because Satan's, one of Satan's biggest weapons is to make us feel alone. Make us feel like we are the one most sinful person that has ever lived, which is frankly ridiculous. We know who that was. That was Hitler, right? Wait, never mind. Um, but I mean, no, honestly, like how many, how many of us have thought at one time or another, essentially been given the thought at least by some, some evil power, oh, you're just the most sinful person. God could never love you, you know, all this stuff, right? There's all of these lies that Satan builds into our lives, bit by bit, brick by brick, which take away from us the ability to truly um, confess our sins to each other, right? Confessing your sins to the priest is necessary because you are confessing them to him in the person of Christ, to God himself, right? That is a different aspect, right? But confessing to each other and living in that kind of community that forgives and understands and supports and, and, and brings together people who um, are experiencing and working through the same sins not just in their sin, but in their solving of that sin, in the things that they're doing, in the ways that they are living through it and changing, so that we may lift each other up. We need so much more of that, right? And part of that key is, what if we started actually being really honest with ourselves about the Eucharist, right? Like, what, not drinking, eating, and drinking judgment to ourselves, right? And, and, and never fearing that we are, because we've dealt with that in our hearts, right? Um, so that is, I think, when, when it comes to that question, if there are smaller sins, if there are things that are kind of coming up and bubbling and whatever, um, if, they're, if you know that they're not enough to really disturb that, if they're the kind that you feel that the Eucharist is enough for, the everyday kind, because that's what the Eucharist is for, then yes. But confession is to disrupt the pattern of everyday sin and to especially disrupt the pattern of sins that are arcing into a lifestyle. 
That's why we're supposed to do it often, right? It's supposed to disrupt the pattern. And so if we're not disrupting that pattern at the Eucharist every week, and if we're not disrupting that pattern every time we're coming in for confession, and if we're not disrupting that pattern by speaking to the people that we know, and if we're not, what's disrupting the pattern, right? That's been given to us as the grace to disrupt the pattern, right? And so I think we need to be careful to not look for ways to disrupt the pattern as little as possible, right? <laughs> we, need to be, we need to be faithful to God's plan for helping us with this, I think is the key. So yes, there are times when there are plaguing niggly sins, the little, the little Pac-Man sins that are nipping at you. Those ones, sometimes you can just go to the Eucharist and it's not that not big a deal, right? Those are the kind when you <laughs> go to the Eucharist and you, you go, oh, my fault, my fault. Oh yeah, yeah, I yelled at that person. You know, <laughs> those kind, those are typically, those are typically the ones where it's still, still fine. And like I said, your con listen to your conscience. It's the organ that's in responsible for help helping you with that. It's not that God has thrown us into this and been like, it's a really grave thing to do this wrong and I gave you no way at all to help with that. No, <laughs> like I gave you the Holy Spirit, I gave you your conscience and the two of them talk to each other. Sometimes they're like vague, weird, weird wiggly feelings, but that's enough, right? Our consciences will speak to us when we let them. And if you start listening to your conscience more, it will speak to you louder and it'll become really annoying and constant. And then you'll go through this period of becoming more and more holy and hopefully at one point you'll become a little bit saintly and they'll talk to you less. That's what we're going for before death here, okay? Like we're, we're, we wanna get to the point where our conscience is not constantly bothering us. <laughs> That is, that, is the, that, is, that is holiness we're talking about there, right? That's being transformed into holiness and righteousness where our conscience is not picking at us day after day. I'm not there yet. None of us probably are. That's fine. We have some wonderful examples of saints who probably got there earlier than the rest of us, but that is not common. We're going to just do our best, and it is okay that it takes time. Anybody else have any other questions about that or about miracles in general? I know a lot about miracles, I find them very interesting. I just have a question about, like, this, I mean, I'm just a single person, but I hear lots of young moms, I work with lots of different families, and mm -hmm. lots of times I hear the question of, like, um, bringing your kids to mass. Mm -hmm. so my mom loved, she heard once say, and I was like, can you throw a few of my children to lead me to sing? And, <laughs> and sometimes that's true about mass, too, for some of these families. And so I just heard lots of moms always talking back and forth about at what point do you um, make the decision to maybe leave your sick kid at home that week and I'll go at 9 o'clock and you go at 11 o'clock and, yeah. and before and after they're at the age where they do receive the Eucharist and maybe, maybe there's not one right answer to that, but have you ever heard that question before? I, I, have, I have some knowledge of this question. Um, there's a couple, of, a couple of things. So I don't have children but I have many friends who have very young children who are at incredibly disruptive ages, and I've been to mass with many of them, so I'm not unfamiliar with this problem. A um, couple things going on here. One, we should not stop bringing our kids to mass ever, at any age, because the mass is the participation. We want to bring them towards heavenly things, and we need to get them used to this in many different ways, right? They need to see right from infancy that this is our practice, and this is what we do, and this is the faith. However, there must be, you know, as someone who has flown recently, put your own oxygen mask on first. <laughs> if you cannot participate in the mask because your children are, are always ill or, or they're, you, you got one of those children who's just, I you know, have friends who have some children who are just the worst children at that particular age that you can imagine. And like, you just need to be able to, to and when, when your life is that hard, and the life of a mother is sacrificial and difficult, and the life of a, of a dad too, but mothers are often the ones, <laughs> she's like preach sister. <laughs> it is difficult, and it is doubly and triply and quadruply and more difficult every child you have, and as Catholics we are called to populate the world with wonderful Catholic children. And so, it is very important to allow yourself to go to Mass sometimes as someone who can receive, truly receive and be there and be part of that. And as married people, we must be taking care of ourselves sacrificially, right? 
you must sometimes make the sacrifice as a spouse to let your spouse go to mass, right? And, and I think that that's, you know, men who are called to sacrifice for yourselves, for your husbands as, the, as Christ loved the church, please let her go to mass with, the, you know, without the kids, right? And vice versa, if someone, and if someone is a single parent that you know who's Catholic, please help them go to mass. Ask them if that's something that they, you know, they need to, to do. Help them make sure they get to mass on a day where there's, you know, confession before mass, so that they can then can experience the the um, sacraments properly, right? And um, those things are all important for us in our, our our formation as people. However, there are going to be times when your kids are sick and screaming, and you're not going to make it to mass, and that's what grace is for, right? Jesus said, like, you let the little children come to me, right? So people have always brought their whole family's mass. Like Pope Francis talked about it being appropriate for people to even like breastfeed in church if their babies needed it. Well, the church has images of Mary breastfeeding Jesus for well, many, yeah, many like, centuries until the Protestants pressured us to stop doing that crazy thing. Yeah. Like icons of We have icons of babies breastfeeding all over the place. Um, in fact, the, if any of you were at the Theology of the Body Conference, they're talking about the icon for chastity is, has a barren breast, right? talking about the milk of chastity. So yeah, it's breastfeeding is a, 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 another aspect, right? Yes, absolutely this is something we should we should understand that there's there's more than one purpose with this, right? Yeah. Well that Continue. reminds me of um, the saints have a lot to say about offering up pain, right? But also there's like those kind of everyday irritations and suffering, right? Um, Saint Therese of Rizzo um, said that she had a sister in her convent whose nose made this weird whistling sound every day during prayers. And so she got really distracted by this weird nose whistle that her sister had. And she would try and offer this up to God, but she couldn't concentrate on the songs because all she could think was that this person in front of her this weird nose whistle. Um, and sometimes that's where we're at. I think with like ancient children, so like I don't even like, I don't know the readings, I don't know what Father said in the homily, like I just took care of my cup. But you were still there and you're offering that up, right? There's a story of oh shoot, I'm gonna forget the saints. Um What's the story? But St. Francis de Sales. Uh, he's visiting a woman who's quite the and she she was dying. She was suffering from a very painful disease. And she said, Father, I um, feel so bad that my pain is so great that I have to let him concentrate on my prayers. Like, it's hard to even, like, I can't say the rosary. I can barely not make it through an our father and then my mind wanders, my pain is me. And he told her, do you not realize that you are much closer to God now than when you said many rosaries? Because be then you were praying to God. And now you are with Christ on the cross, right? Suffering with him. And if you've talked to any parent, there are great periods of suffering in parenting. It is a part. Aren't you still suffering? I can see you being one of my sons right next to me. I should be very quiet. But no, it's it's um it is there is great suffering involved in giving yourself up to parent, right? And so that suffering and that, remember that you are still living the spiritual life even outside of mass, right? We're going out to live the spiritual life. But parents feel really guilty about it, so that's a really yes. good. Thing. But Satan's very good at making us feel guilty about yeah. mass yeah. instead of making us re recognize the blessing they are to us. Listen, if you go to Sacred Heart and you find like soil on the floor, that's my kid. Every single Sunday, that body that's like when we struggled with the reality like Jason would go I, I get to go to weekly mass so if, Jay, if I didn't go to crazy I take him out because Jason didn't go to no. uh, and we struggled because we could go by ourselves and God was just really believed to us and he's like I need them there because they don't they're more spiritually connected to Christ than we are they, they see so much more than we do and their sensitivities are so much greater they were just with him Three years ago, in comparison to us, and, uh, in my own understanding. But uh, 
parents, uh, it's hard because of the judgment of the church. That's what makes it hard. If people with screaming kids had neighbors that were loving and said, hey, listen, I'll be there too, like, it would be different. But we're, we're questioning that because when we go to Mass, it's like, okay, you need to be a good kid. And you can't ask that. It's super weird. Um, so the reality is, we go and we do the best that we can and we teach them how to be, teach them how to be present, we teach them how to be present, we teach them how to be present, we engage them the best we can, but we need help. We need your help, and we need your support. Because um, I had to remind some lady at the church, I was like, do you remember how much of a butthead you were when you were too? Because it's not far from the truth, and we all were. Um, and with this generation of children, they're more spirited than we ever were. And I don't know, some of them are more. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the the idea of personal freedom has expanded massively in the last fifty years. Yeah. And you all wish that like your child would be like a little three year old who's like growing up to touch the picture of right. Jesus and be like, I want to sit quietly with God. But we do not all get this child. Get I gave the reason why they won't put up the baptismal font as it was. That's supposed to be like a full and more school that you can sit and they don't water it, and then Father Tom was like going back and forth with the decision. I told him my kid would be like, I'm He just wants to get baptized again. No. It's okay. No. No, no. Don't get baptized again. It's like, it's just in my mind that are the reason we don't have it for a <laughs> so it is. All that thing. being said, let's look at the other the flip side of this. It is not that child's responsibility to make you less distracted. <laughs> that is your responsibility. I've, I've had people staring at me because we were praying the rosary too loud, okay? Like, that is not my responsibility to change my, <laughs> to change my prayer to suit, you know, to some degree, yes, I need to be respectful to other people as an adult, but a child is only responsible for how much they could do, and at age, you know, three and under, that's a whole heck of nothing. So the next time, if you're looking at my kid, you're not looking. Yeah, it is our responsibility to ask, ask God for that and to offer up our distractions and to be okay with them and to recognize, you know, there's the whole mindfulness craze and, and, and um, meditation craze that's going on in the world right now. And you know what they say to you on these meditation tapes? It's okay if your mind wanders. Just bring it back and keep going. That is what we need to do in Mass. That's what we need to do in prayer. That's what you just bring yourself back and you keep going, right? Um, that is self-control. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. So the more time we spend with God, the more we can do that. Right? Some of the self-control is going to be stopping staring at children in mass. Do not turn around. Don't turn around and look at that child. Because the mother or father of that child is suffering already. And then you will be making them suffer more. Right? Right. <laughs> so I think, yes, we ought to bring our children to mass. We ought to also make sure that we are being fed. Right? And we ought to lift each other up. And as complete strangers in the mass, if someone's kid is being crazy, help them. If you can, <laughs> you know, um, be be a be a collective parent when you have the chance. Um, give people chances, right? Smile at a parent who's having a difficult child day, right? If you're gonna if you if you catch yourself looking at them and you do not smile, right? Like give them something because it is so difficult to raise a child who is, is that hard. You know, one of my best friends has, has had some kids who are just very, 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 very difficult young children. And like that has been a, a great trial to her for many years. And so I've seen firsthand in her life how difficult that life has been for her and, and how much suffering she's gone through to have these children in her life. So I think let us, let us give great grace to people who are in that situation as the church. And it will be easier for them to come to church even given the situation. Um, it's it's hard for people to to get child care to come to church if their kids are in that space, right? And if they need to come to church that day and they're like, man, I really need Christ today. I need to come to church. I need to be in this place. I need a break from my home life. You know, I need this. And that means they have to drag their kids to church on a day when it's really hard. We need to give them grace because we don't know what they're going through, except we kind of do. We can see it. It's right there, right? We can see just a little bit of what they're going through, right? And we should have great grace for that because there's there is suffering in parenthood, and we need to give people the chance to come in whatever their circumstances. Because many people do not have the the money or the spouse or the wherewithal to be able to leave their kids home and still make demands, or the.
friends or the community or anything. So I think it's really important to give people that grace um, as a church. I think it's an area in which we give people very little grace is parenting, right? Part of our culture is that there are right ways to parent, and if you don't know them, it's your fault. And like, if your kids are crazy, it's clearly you. And like, all that stuff, and I, I just, I can't believe that anymore. I know too many parents. <laughs> You know, too many wonderful people who are parents and whose children are terrible. I'm like, wow, this is, this is tough. Like, I, if I had to deal with this, I don't know what I would do. I would go insane. And maybe one day I will, you know, by the grace of God, have to deal with that as a married woman. So I think there's, um, there's, a, lot of, um, there's a lot of grace we need to give parents to do that, right? And again, the, the, the evil one is going to whisper in your ear, people are going to look at you funny. They're going to say you're a bad parent. And do whatever. He will do anything he can to keep you out, right? Whether or not your children are there. You know, he'll say, you can't win one way or the other. If you go without your children, you're leaving them out of the mass, and they won't know anything about the faith. If you go by yourself, you know, if you go, if you go with them, no one else will learn about the faith. The whole <laughs> service! <laughs> right? Um, and anything he can do to keep you away, right? So... We need to give grace to people when they do come with their kids, and we need to sometimes give them a chance to come without their kids. And I think that that kind of grace can solve that for people. And and you know, not listening to the horrible, you can't do it right voices that come to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, but it will be last Monday of the month. Um, we will be celebrating Easter. So